Hi, my name's Christine, and um, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. So yeah, uh, you know, my role within Siemens, just so you guys understand where I'm coming from, is um, is I, I work with building automation sensors systems. So if you guys look around the room, you'll probably see temperature sensors over there with hand sanitizer resting on them currently um, that are uh, say Siemens on them. And so basically, what we do is we control the building. So you know, in an application like this, we're doing some very basic things like controlling for temperature um, and looking at some of the main energy meters in the building, but um, you know, there's a lot more that we could be doing. So just to start, um, to give you guys a little bit of background on how the smart building industry has evolved. So we as building automation systems kind of position our gator because we control a large amount of the data presently in the building, so it's a natural fit for us to suck up data from other subsystems. Years and years ago, we started out as a pneumatic control system. So 20 years ago, we weren't even in the world of data, much like anybody else, right? But it was compressed air through tubing throughout the building. And then once computers became more widely available, we moved to electronic signals. Um, and for the first time, people actually had a graphic interface that they could even see what the building was, um, was doing. They, they actually had feedback, and they could start to monitor and track um, metrics in the building. And then the evolution uh, was went to systems within the building where you can integrate chillers and boilers and pieces of equipment, um, lighting to building automation. So it was still closed within the building itself. And then with the addition of the ethernet, um, systems have become uh, you know, all Ethernet based, so everything's connected over the web. So there's a lot more openness in terms of what we can connect to. Um, you can think about the amount of information that can be passed between systems, and then once you open it up to which, what can be passed outside of the building and to everybody that enters the building, to everybody that might want to view the building on a web portal somewhere, exponentially um, increases, right? The number of stakeholders. Um, what you can do in terms of um, mining that data and, and uh, spinning it back out in terms of visualization tools, 2D, going to 3D, um, remotely accessing the building, remote monitoring and control, um, external data sources like weather modeling tools that can be used not only to just react to the conditions that are in the building, but to actually predict what's going to happen and use software and programming to control a building based on future scenarios. Then the whole concept of openness comes into play, and I think that goes back to what Andy's comment was in terms of maybe a generational shift in how open we feel comfortably and, and how much data we can share, how much data we can make available to people just coming close to or in contact with the building for a time versus people who really need to manage the, the building to make uh, good decisions. And I think that that ultimately, what it goes back to, um, speaker was David. David, um, he really made a good point that it's really about people. That the buildings are built to house people, to give us a place to work, to give us a place to gather, right? So it's about enhancing the productivity of those people that have to manage and maintain and operate the building. Um, it's about making the tenants feel more comfortable and more productive, um, and looking for ways to drive revenue, right? So making people more productive, saves money, or in the case of maybe a commercial retail application, helping direct people to where they will spend more money rather than having them wander aimlessly, right? So all of that adds to empowering us to make better decisions. That's why we want the data in the first place. And also increasing our satisfaction as employees, tenants, um, and visitors, and, and just our personal lives. So a lot of people come to Siemens and they say, what is a smart building? Help me define it. And you can find plenty of definitions um, on the internet. But some of the key buzzwords that get thrown around for uh, smart building are things like open, um, vis visualization, energy management. A lot of people think that green buildings are synonymous with smart buildings. It incorporates a degree of asset management that's outside of just your basic facilities infrastructure. Um, obviously, data analytics is a big part of it. It's interactive. That's that two-way communication between the tenants and the 
facilities personnel, the building and the surrounding community, system to system. Um, and really what it is, is converging the physical infrastructure with data, right? So it's no longer just a physical object in space, but there's, um, you know, the data attributes that uh, apply to it. And apparently there's a Siemens definition out there in one of our videos that says, smart buildings include solutions that turn buildings into living organisms, networked, intelligent, sensitive, and adaptable. And I kind of like that because it, it, it implies that there's a constant renewal and adaptation and it's current um, and it's responsive to changing conditions. So this is a picture uh, just to give you guys kind of an idea. And, and let me take a point. I think we're still, I think I see a lot of familiar faces. So I think I'm still dealing with mostly people from the AEC industry. Um, but for anybody that's not from the AEC industry, you can see from this photo that there's a large number of physical systems that we have to have to manage. So this is the basic, this is the basics of what a smart building would be today, right? We've got renewable energy sources, we've got your basic HVAC uh, systems, they might be a parking management, um, you might have two-way communication with the grid, so you're sending information back to the utility or you're turning on and off your renewable sources. Obviously, there's security systems, fire alarms, so everything to do with life safety, energy management, um, lighting controls, parking, water conservation, etc. So as it stands today, you have a building that has a lot of smart systems, they're communicating each other, and they may be communicating fairly effectively to your facilities manager, maybe an energy manager or somebody else in the real estate department. Other characteristics of a, of a smart building, so you can see here again the list of systems that are contributing to your database, HVAC, lighting, electrical, renewables. And then that delay, that data is not collected, so everything is basically uh, fed up to a cloud or some other server type of uh, storage platform. And those types of software, so we have a building automation system, there's applications within the automation system, and this is where there's a the, kind of an open field, right, for us to take the data and do something with it. And this is really where the industry is starting to have to flex its muscle and see who will who will ultimately own the data. Is it because we have so much, but what are we doing with it? And I think that's why a lot of people are here today, is because they see the opportunity as software developers to do something with the data that's not being done. The data is optimized, gives us, and what we like to say is an, is in an actionable format. Tons of raw data who can give it back to me in a way that I can make intelligent decisions. And at the moment, we're spending a lot of time focusing on the people that buy that from us, right? Facilities people, um, the real estate department. But, you know, there might be an entire subset of people and users that are left out of that um, who don't have access to that information. And then you make better decisions. We have better, uh, reports and, and things to actually see transparently what's going on in the building. And the other piece of it is the mobility, right? So taking this information on the go. So I posed the question to you guys, you know, being here with the hackathon, right? We're trying to think outside the box and think, think what we can do differently, what's broken. And so the question that I have is, what if anyone could be a producer or a consumer of building data? Because right now, only the people in the back of the house with the right set of keys have access to that data. So what if anybody was giving information to the building and then receiving information back? What could we do? What could we do with that information? What are we missing? What, what, could you, what would you want if you were walking into your office that you don't get today? I mean, everybody at some point in their day probably walks into a building either to work, to shop, social gatherings. Um, but once you enter that building, you're, you're fairly cut off from actually what's going on. So I circle the IT manager and the building occupant here, just as two, two types of individuals that have not necessarily been catered to by the smart building industry thus far. The huge potential. So 
So there, then again, you have all those different stakeholders, right? And they all have a different set of needs. They all have a different desire for information. And this is really what we we talk about when we when we talk with contractors and people like that that are saying, what is a smart building? Help me understand this. And it's really bringing the conversation about what you want to do with the information um, to the foreground and having <coughs> contact with all of these different stakeholders. So it's a complicated process. And that's why, you know, I think of is there is there a potential shift in the marketplace to go from a central model of control where everything is owned by a single automation company to a more distributed model where we make data freely available like the iPhone, if you will, and then it's left to an open community to develop apps to actually do something with that data. And just to give you guys an idea of what type, what the quantity of information that we're dealing with. Um, if you have a customer with a portfolio of 100 buildings and you have 1,000 points, and 1,000 points really isn't that big, and we're talking hardwired devices, not even a smart piece of equipment which could have hundreds of points of information on its own. And if you're trending that information at 15 minutes, uh, at 15, 15 minute intervals, you can see very quickly that that's a lot of data to manage. Um, and a lot of your facilities managers are not accustomed to doing anything with that information. Um, and the industry, having come from pneumatics, obviously has a long way to go in terms of knowing what to do with the information as well. So that's why we open the floor up to folks like the people that are attending here today to figure out what we could be doing with the billions of points of information a year. This is my last slide, and I stole it from another presentation done by Frost and Sullivan. And um, I really like the slide, though, because it really blends what we're here to talk about today, which is the convergence of the IT community and building systems. And that's really what defines a smart building. And that's really where we see the need. And um, for those of you that are working in the building industry, you know that your facilities guy is now working with all these IT-based systems. So he's having to pull himself more into the IT realm, as are the contractors. Um, your IT guy can no longer just manage his servers and his IT assets. He has to know how buildings are run. So I don't think it's a competition between facilities or IT. We need to really come together. And I think this is where you see a lot more people forming standards and where we see the possibilities of using the building information model um, for facilities management and how we can integrate um, you know, the building data and standardize from the design all the way through the operation and maintenance. And I think this is also a part where we have the feedback. What, we, what, can we standardize, what can we standardize on in terms of the information that we're giving back to the surrounding community? What are we giving back to PG&E and the utility companies? What is it that the city of San Francisco wants to know about your building um, so that they can have enhanced parking solutions or whatever it may be? Um, and that's kind of where you know we have a, a wide open field to find the answers. So that's my spiel and smart building. Yeah. You know, uh, the place where I see the convergence between facilities and IT is a power over Ethernet. So for people that don't know about POE, power over Ethernet, uh, at places like Cisco, uh, where you're essentially, where you have your telephone systems, where you have certain uh, electrical devices that typically plug into uh, 110 volts and then use a, a brick to basically uh, reduce the voltage to a DC voltage. Power over Ethernet is now sending uh, about uh, 35, 40 volts, whatever the voltage is, to these devices that are now tracked in the computer systems. And you can now turn things on, turn things off through your computer systems, including um, HVAC, turn on lights, turn, uh, turn on uh, your heating and cooling, adjust your heating and cooling from, from your telephone. So again, and then again, power over Ethernet. Uh, you can do that from a handheld device to places in your room or other parts of the building. So, uh, you know, again, power over Ethan, I, I think it's going to be uh, a really important thing going forward uh, for the building industry. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, I think that dovetails nicely. And one of the, one of the frontiers as a building automation and a smart building system we've had difficulty with is uh, plug loads in particular, um, where we haven't been able to touch those end devices, the, the heater that's under the desk, the light that people leave on, all those manual things. So there's companies out there like Julex, and I think recently Cisco bought them, um, where they have, you know, power strips, which are, you know, I think they were really popular for like a retro, retrofit situation, um, where you have a power strip and you plug everything in and now it's got an IP address and you have a little app, you can turn things on and off remotely. Um, and if you uh, want to find Chris Casilli, he's sitting over here at the end, he can show you guys what we have currently in terms of our handheld iPad app to have the occupants of the building have some degree of interaction with their environment, be able to control it remotely. Yes, so Chris. Exactly. <laughs> Like yeah, I mean, and you guys, you know, obviously, we're starting to see a lot more of that crossover, right, between traditional building companies like Siemens, Johnson Controls, and then now you have companies like IBM and Google and Cisco wanting to enter the building data market. So. Well, Cisco only wants to enter it because everything requires an IP address, and all those IP addresses have to go through. Servers, routers, right. bridges, and all the content that Cisco sells. So, mm -hmm. the more devices that have IP addresses, the more they can sell. Yes. Steve, let's talk with the San Francisco. There's a lot of neat buildings coming up, and I was just talking uh, to Eric and Swinner and Builders. These lead from preservation, they're just for design. So, there are only a few buildings of monitoring systems. We actually don't know how these lead buildings are performing, and often they don't perform very well. Mm -hmm. And I think there was. So I think the monitoring system is very important. I think the people in the city of San Francisco want to know, um, especially in the public buildings like the, the waterfront. Right. The SFPUC has the greenest building in the in the United States at this moment. But how is it performing? And those monitoring systems need to go in the environmental monitoring. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a deficiency in, in lead as it has been thus far, is that it doesn't necessarily require the implementation of that NMV plan, just that there is a plan. Um, and you know, what we find is that there definitely is drift. Um, and you know, there's always the human factor with with highly efficient smart buildings buildings and, and that sometimes they're very complex controls a lot of different systems underfloor error and you know it's connected to window shades and all this so sometimes over time the user may not understand the system they throw things in hand and things things don't retain their level of efficiency um, but yeah I think there was actually a study done too that showed a lot of the lead buildings along the Market Street corridor are not performing as well as they used to yeah, especially when the new lead building will have their own wastewater treatment system. Most of you don't know, those are called living machines. They're supposed to process the wastewater and have zero discharge. Well, we don't know how those systems are performing. Um, uh, actually, do they have actually zero waste discharge, both air and liquids? And those monitoring systems need to go in, both um, physical mass balance volumes and also the chemistry. So I think those, those are very important. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that, especially in the public sphere, right, that, that speaks to that two-way communication where there's 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 a, an, an opening where we, if the, if the city of San Francisco wanted to mandate that we automatically feed them certain building parameters, somebody would have to invest in that and we get on our building automation systems and start sending that information over the internet. So, um, you know, I think the point was made by David that the industry typically doesn't adopt things until they have to, right? So, they have to now. contact your local. Well, I mean, taxpayer pay for these buildings, mm -hmm. especially the public buildings, and they're entitled to the performance data, and so they're going to have to. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.